Hello everybody, before we get into the video for uh, the Diagramming Salesforce Solutions session by Matthew Morris, I would like to give a shout out to London Calling because apparently uh, this presentation was first uh, carried out at London Calling. And Matthew was kind enough to present it for the Jacksonville Architects Trailblazer user group. And I have a couple of observations before we get into the video here. First of all, the title does not entirely represent what the contents entail. Uh, I think Matthew in this presentation uh, gives us tools and methods on how to analyze a new implementation for Salesforce or like a big project that will modify the existing configuration in a significant manner. So, you know, it's not only uh, about diagramming the Salesforce instance, it's also about uh, the architectural review and architectural presentation that is needed uh, to carry out an implementation project. And second of all, the more I listen to presentations on architecture, I realize Architecture is mostly about communications and facilitating fruitful dis discussions uh, with the team. So that is an integral part of the duty here. And it is the major task. And finally, it is evident now by watching, you're going to see it for yourself, that Matthew speaks from uh, experience and he has vast experience in this area uh, that you can learn from. So without further ado, uh, I present you uh, Matthew Morris's presentation on diagramming Salesforce solutions. And if you like this session, please give me a like and subscribe on the YouTube channel. So this is the Salesforce Architect Group Jacksonville and it's a rather new group. Uh, this is our second meeting. What I try to do with this group is I try and find to the point content by the expert and I try to deliver that within an hour. Um, and we, we usually do it like midday like this. It's good for uh, like uh, UK and also Pacific time as well. Uh, we don't really do a lot of like swags and things like that. That's not what we are here for. And, and I try to promote it to the right audience to get like a quality audience together so that we can ask questions and discuss topics the way we want. Now, I'm your community group leader, Andy Engelutkan. Um, I'm an application architect. Uh, I am uh, striving to be an architect, let's say it that way. Everybody who uh, is on the path to become an architect or an architect is welcome in this audience and my area of expertise I spend a lot of time building flows teaching flows I have a site called salesforcebreak.com and you can see my LinkedIn Twitter I publish a newsletter every week and I also host a slack for free flow support you can join us you the link is on salesforcebreak.com uh, and I host a YouTube channel as well Salesforce break so I'm super thrilled today to have Matthew Morris with us. Matthew is CTA, right, Matthew? Uh, technical. Not. You're not lots, yet? Lots of people think I am, but now I am not. Okay, well, uh, he is on his path to become a CTA. I think he'll tell us more about this. He is a Salesforce Innovation Director of Cap, at Capgemini, and uh, he is obsessed with apparently mapping uh, uh, probably more than I am because, you know, that's also an area that I love. And he's going to tell us all about it. He had a presentation uh, at London Calling and everybody raved about this presentation. Thank you very much for taking the time to present to us today, uh, Matthew. And let me just let you share your screen right here. Thank you. And thanks, Andy, for that kind introduction. And, and thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day whether it's uh, 5 p.m. as it is here in the UK where I am or uh, lunchtime for you. Um, so yeah, um, I will share my screen and we can make sure everything is working properly. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to use my slides from London's call in, uh, but I did update them for the uh, the session today by putting a palm tree on. So hopefully you're seeing that. Oh, so that's good. nice. Yeah. Nice touch. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, I invested a large amount of time finding that graphic off of the internet. So <laughs> I just just wish I was in Jacksonville, you know, on the sand with my toes in the water. But um, you know, that'll maybe have to wait till uh, later in the year. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the presentation I gave at London's calling back in June, um, and um, I'll give you a little bit of background as to where the presentation actually comes from. It's got quite a long history, uh, which follows my journey. Um, through um, striving to be a Salesforce architect, um, aspiring to be a Salesforce architect as I do every day, really. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, and I'll introduce myself. So um, my job today, I'm the uh, Salesforce Innovation Director at Camp Gemini in the UK. Uh, so we're a large GSI um, working, uh, I spent half my time working on large projects and the other half um, doing business development and also coordinating with ISVs and other colleagues around uh, Europe um, to share knowledge, best practice, um, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but I haven't always done that job. So um, way back um, in the midst of time, uh, not quite as old as these computers here behind me, but uh, back in the midst of time, I, I did lots of stuff that wasn't cloud um, all the way up till about 2009. And then I was sort of reborn in the cloud when I first came into contact with Salesforce um, and uh, you know, did the first, uh, did our first Salesforce project, um, which we actually wrote a case management system on force.com. Probably would have used Service Cloud today, but um, you know these are the lessons that we learn. Um, and then I've been very involved in the community um, as that's grown up in Salesforce as well. And, you know, I have to say, hasn't that changed a lot in the last uh, 12, 13 years uh, since I've been involved? Um, but in 2011, um, started the uh, Salesforce user group in Bristol, uh, which is where I live, which is where I'm talking to you from today. Um, and um, I probably wouldn't have ever got into the certification journey if it hadn't been for a young developer that, that uh, worked, at, um, worked at my company. And he challenged... Uh, the, the directors of the company to get certified. So I did my first admin cert um, 2012. Admin for me remains the hardest one. It's that mixture of recall and, and uh, application practical scenarios. So um, admin for me is kind of a really good way to start, uh, not the easiest, but a good way. Um, and that was also the first year that I went to Dreamforce in 2012. Um, and that sort of opened my eyes to, gosh, there's quite a lot going on here, isn't there? Um, and then I got some more certs, did more projects, um, and then 2014 started the London Admin User Group, um, which is still running today, and we're celebrating our eighth birthday next week. Uh, so time has really, really flown there. And through all of that work, all that activity, and, and I think I was doing some podcasts and, and other stuff at the time, I was recognized as Salesforce MVP in 2015. And that coincided with the launch of Trailhead, which, you know, has obviously been a, a huge part of all of our, uh, our Salesforce lives over the last um, uh, six or seven years, a bit longer. Um, so I was wearing my first Trailhead badge and my, my, my Trailblazer hoodie. I got a new Trailblazer hoodie at uh, Dreamforce this year, though, so it's good. My one was a little bit grey. And it also marked kind of my first true steps, I think, into being a Salesforce architect. So let's bring it back round to architecture and diagrammings. Um, that's where I moved from working on small business projects to more enterprise projects. Um, and I will confess, I've been a small business guy pretty much all of my career. Uh, and it's very interesting. Small businesses always want to be like large businesses. Um, and then when you go to large businesses, they're trying to be like small businesses and be more agile and be more uh, dynamic. So uh, the grass is always greener, it seems. Um, but it was, you know, at that point I kind of got exposure to working with enterprise architects, um, working with Salesforce centers of excellence. Um, and I sort of moved from being what I've been for quite a lot of my career, which is a, more of a general consultant into, um, into the architect role and, and, you know, looking at, you know, the things such as integration, you know, looking at security, all of those other concerns that maybe consultants don't worry quite so much about. Um, 
And then that was uh, also coincided with the time that um, the Salesforce CTA um, certification kind of started to get a little bit more structure around it. And they, they brought out the, um, the domains and the, the additional certificates that go with that. And that's for me actually started the need for me to process information and build diagrams from it because in 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 studying for that uh, certification you know you're given scenarios and you know you need to apply the learnings that you've had from from those different certifications to digest the information on the page in a short amount of time and you know tell a story so that's how uh, some of the diagramming techniques and frameworks you'll see um, in the presentation came about um, and then that led to me um, doing pretty much the sort of the early version of this presentation you're seeing today on a video with Pluralsight, which um, people still come up to me today and say, I saw your video on Pluralsight, which makes me very happy because uh, it continues to help people. Um, and it's hard to believe that that was uh, 2017. Um, so that's available for free, still available for free, and there'll be some links on here. And then we did some more videos, myself and uh, Gemma Blessard from Ladies B Architects, as we were preparing for the CTA Review Board. It's actually my third attempt at the CTA Review Board in 2019. Um, and those are up on YouTube and on the Ladies B Architects channel as well. Uh, would I do it like that for a review board? Probably wouldn't, actually, now that we've, we've learned a lot more and the, you know, the community has kind of got a good playbook on, on um, how to do things. But there's, I would say, certainly a lot of valuable insights there. So thank you for listening to my life story. Um, but hopefully that gives you some context as to where all of this comes from. So um, I'll start off by recapping, you know, the basics around diagram and Salesforce solutions that I learned, that I, you know, I learned for myself, I learned the hard way, um, which is how I always learn, it always seems to be the hard way. Um, and then you know, we'll go through the techniques around you know, extracting, structuring, validating, and communicating, uh, which is where diagrams can be particularly useful. I'll talk about the four key diagrams um, that for me remain um, the cornerstones of, of telling the story when you're working with stakeholders, both at the start of a project and throughout, throughout the life. Um, and then we'll look at some expanded content. So this is stuff that I added this year based on really my experiences over the last five or six years to look at sequences, capability diagrams, process diagrams. Um, and then finally, we'll look at what Salesforce is doing in the diagramming space, because there's been a lot of change um, over the last year or 18 months. Um, lots of excellent stuff coming out of that. So you can apply some of the techniques that I show you uh, at the beginning, and you can have it look awesome uh, and be really useful using some of the stuff that Salesforce is producing. Um, so 2017, Salt Lake City, this is where we recorded um, Diagram and Salesforce Solutions. Um, I'm, I'm a lot less gray hair there, so the, the years have not been kind since. Um, that bit.ly link, though, still works. So bit.ly uh, DSFS LC22, um, if you want to link to this, or you can just Google Diagram and Salesforce Solutions plural site, it'll come up. You can watch it for free. Um, and in that, I walked through a scenario and with a camera that was overhead, um, you know, I would draw out um, what we were seeing written in words and turn that into uh, into diagrams. Um, so that's all, all, all available. Go ahead and watch it. And, you know, as, as I look at some of the as I go back and watch it, sometimes I look at and I, I wouldn't exactly draw the diagram like that anymore. Um, but the techniques remain the same. And I think that's one of the one of the things when it comes to diagrams and telling the story. Uh, don't be afraid to find your own style that works for you. Um, and I've, I've adapted and evolved my style since 2016, 2017. Um, and you can do it in real time. So, you know, here are some screenshots from where we did um, the, the concept for Ladies Be Architects. Um, that's my kitchen wall with some um, with some paper taped up against it. I think I use blue tack actually. Um, and these, you know, these are kind of good things to to practice and experiment because that sort of for me has set, set me in a good foundation when uh, in a workshop environment or a collaboration environment with clients to be able to, you know, take information, take things that people are talking about and represent it. Um, 
you know, on a, on a whiteboard or on a screen. Um, and then you can build engagement and feedback from your stakeholders um, in that way. And the diagrams on here are the four key diagrams that we're going to talk about as well. So whether it's in real life or in some imagined scenario, um, the technique that I, or the path I follow is about extract the requirements, then that'll allow you to structure a solution. You can then validate that solution with your stakeholders um, and then communicate it both with them and more widely. And it's really uh, a rinse and repeat process, right? So in the first stage, you're going to be capturing you know, what is often called the as is, you know, the current state of the architecture. And then you're going to structure that and validate, hey guys, is this what you've got? Um, and then you can also then work on, based on what they want to do, the 2B or the target architecture. And you can say, okay, if what you this is what you've told me, and this is therefore the approach that I would take in order to achieve that, right? And that could be integrations between different systems. Uh, it could be the approach that you're taking for user licensing. Uh, it could be um, how you would control the visibility of different database records on, on different objects. So it works with as is and to be. Um, and, you know, this is really best expressed in by watching the video in terms of going through line by line and, you know, depending on how much experience you've had, you know, as a consultant or, you know, as a, as an architect, you know, or as a business analyst, even, um, you can sharpen your skills in spotting keywords inside the body of the text, right? So you're looking to spot uh, a number of different things. And these are the things that I go after. So I try to keep it simple um, and I still use this technique today. Um, as I'm going through requirements, you know, could, could be a, some kind of an RFP in a bid process, like in my current job. Um, I'm looking for, okay, who are the actors in the system, right? So who are the people who are gonna be using the system? So as I'm reading through, when individual people or job roles are mentioned, I'm writing those down in one quadrant on my, on my piece of paper. And what I'll normally do is do this by hand. Um, it's just my style. You might be a spreadsheet type person. Um, you might be, you know, use a word processor. I don't know, but it, it all works. What I tend to do is take a piece of A4 paper uh, and just divide it up into quadrants. And, you know, I will capture the actors. And if I've got a sense of the story that I'm being told from the requirements, I will maybe note in some brackets what license I think they're going to be. So if we've got, um, in this example here, a front office user, they might just need some kind of a Salesforce sales cloud license. Yeah, if it's mentioning um, external users, well, that's going to be some kind of a community license, right? It could be a partner community, could be customer community. Um, you know, could be customer community plus if you want to get into the detail, but that's maybe something that you're going to do on a later pass. So don't get hung up on um, getting the ultimate level of detail. You're really looking to capture in the first pass, you know, the high level view of things. So you might come out of that with a list of actors, but you won't, don't yet have a view on what the license is that they need. Uh, on the right hand side, you're looking for systems. So where there's an existing system mentioned, maybe it's got a name, maybe it's just referred to as CRM, um, but they're saying that they wanna replace it, I'll capture that. So in brackets, I'll say whether it's gonna be replaced, whether it's new, whether it's existing and they're gonna keep it, whether it's internal, whether it's external, right? So if we've got maybe an integration to a Dun & Bradstreet or something like that, that's an external system that we don't control, but still needs to be mentioned um, you know, in my list of systems and ultimately on my landscape. So once you've got the, the users who are actors in, in, the, um, in our solution and our systems, um, you can also start to spot Salesforce objects. And again, this is where practice and experience in the Salesforce world can help you. Now, there's a couple of approaches that you can take and that I have taken in the past around this. It might be that there's an object or, or some kind of a data store mentioned, but you're not entirely sure what Salesforce object that might be. 
that's fine. Just write it down with whatever name they've given to it. Um, and you can put, you know, next to it, account, question mark, case, question mark. If you're certain you know what it is, you can probably just write it straight down. And then one of the other things I find very, very useful to capture at the beginning is some kind of an idea of um, how many records that might be. Now, those can sometimes be called out explicitly, um, you know, such as we get 100,000 orders a month, or it could be implied, right? So it could be implied that they've got X number of current customers and they get so many more per year. Depending on the data model, you're going to need to determine, okay, is that account records, contact records, or account and contact records? So again, that's where experience um, and practice comes into play in terms of um, coming up with those numbers. But the reason I find it's very, very useful is it stops you going back through the document and hunting for those figures again, right? And even if you highlight things, I tend to sort of go a bit word blind. Like, oh, where is that? Was that on page two? So it does save a lot of time if you can capture some of these key pieces of information in your, in your first pass. And then the last thing is, what are the integrations? So we captured systems in the box above, but what are the system to system integrations, particularly in the Salesforce world and you know, inevitably in, in technology, there's never gonna be just one system, right? There's always gonna be multiple clouds or you know, cloud systems talking to on-premise systems. Um, so again, this is really, really useful to capture it upfront um, and you can indicate with arrows the direction of travel. You know, is, is the integration both ways? Is it only in one way? You know, for example, Salesforce is only sending orders to the ERP. We never hear anything back. Sounds like it's a bit weird, but, you know, those things can happen. Or, it, you know, it, is the integration going to need to happen in, in both directions? So that's the capture exercise. And like I say, I can normally get that, squeeze that in on one page. It might look a bit messy at the end, in which case that's when you rewrite it up again in a, in a fair hand. But um, you've now got the information that you need to start put together your key diagrams. And for me, there's four key diagrams that are needed to tell the story. Um, you can supplement with others, but I think that these are the ones that are needed um, you know, to come up with a solution that you can prove um, is on the right path and holds water. So first thing is the Salesforce data model. So what are the objects that we're gonna be using and how are they related to each other? What standard objects have we got? What custom objects have we got? Maybe we've got external objects, maybe we've got big objects. So all of those can be represented in your data model and the relationships um, between them. Uh, we'll come into a little bit more detail on, on each of these in a minute, but the relationship types um, is, is something that's very significant in the Salesforce world, whether it's a master detail or a lookup. And then going in hand, with, uh, hand in hand with the Salesforce data model is the Salesforce role hierarchy. So bottom left here. Um, and that's because the owners of records in particular objects are critical to the way that the data visibility is controlled. And you can only really um, form a view or, you know, if you, if you want to say, oh, how's this going to work? You know, how are we going to share accounts, for example, by looking at not only the object, but also the role hierarchy. So, you know, okay, these types of, uh, these record types are going to be owned by one type of user, whether they sit in the role hierarchy. We've got a different record type that's going to be owned by another user, whether they sit in the role hierarchy. And there's a number of, of different uh, things that can change in terms of record ownership um, uh, and record owner um, that would affect the, the visibility of that record. So that's how the, um, the data model and the role hierarchy work together. And then if we zoom out, we've got system landscape. Um, so this is taking your list of systems and your system to system integration um, and then representing that on a page you know, in a picture so that you can point and say, Salesforce is the center of my universe, um, but we have a number of other systems. Let me tell you how, uh, you know, the information between them is, is going to flow. Let me tell you who are going to be the users in each particular system. 
um, and you know what their role is. You can also mark what's going to be retired. So in this example here in the in the system landscape, I've kind of got a combined view of as is and to be, um, depending on how complex it is or the story that you want to tell, you might choose to separate those. Um, and I often do these days. Um, but it, it's a good way to mark, okay, you know, our existing on-premise CRM here that's behind the firewall, um, that's going to be replaced and put a big red X in it. So not a highly technical document, but really, really valuable for helping stakeholders. Um, and that can include technical stakeholders who aren't familiar with, with Salesforce, who aren't familiar with cloud, um, helping them understand um, you know, the, how the different systems will interact. And then the last of the four uh, pictures is um, the, the deployment diagram or the environment diagram, right? So this is increasingly important, I would say, um, now that we are moving to a more DevOpsy um, deployment approach with Salesforce. So Salesforce now have DevOps Center, there's a number of third party DevOps tools. You can do it all from the command line. But the move to, you know, the source repository is now the source of truth, not the production org. Um, there's a number of things that that I use my environment diagram, my deployment diagram for. Um, and I've been working um, you know, just this year on making more sophisticated versions of this to tell the story. But there's things here that it's very important to work with technical colleagues who might be in the testing teams, um, who might be um, in um, you know, other areas of architecture within the company to explain to them, OK, Salesforce has sandboxes. Um, you know, here are the, the data limitations that we have on different types of sandboxes. You know, it's just a developer sandbox. It's not going to have a lot of data. This is a full copy sandbox. We have all the data, but um, you know, we only have one of them. And also if we want to refresh it, we've got some constraints around that. We can only refresh it every 30 days. And you can do things like tie that up with test environments on other systems. So if there's an ERP system, SAP or something like that, you can say, okay, my, um, my QA sandbox is going to be connected to this instance of, you know, in the SAP environment. So lots of ways in which this can be used. And then when it comes to talking about what's the path for promotion and, you know, if you are using source, source control, which is you know, very much the norm in, in larger projects these days, you can talk about what the branching strategy is and how that relates to um, each, of the, each of the sandboxes. So I think I probably did a double click on some of these. Yeah. So, um, using diagrams to um, as a tool for discussion. So we've, you know, we've gone through the exercise of extracting all this data. We've um, drawn some nice pictures based on the information that we, we had and produced those diagrams. Here's some examples of you know, people we might want to discuss with. So um, you know, playback of the difference between the as is and the to be, that's really useful when you're talking with your users. Before you even start anything, you know, is the vision that you're presenting as an architect aligned with that of the project sponsor? So you might have looked at things and said, ah, oh, there's definitely opportunity here to rationalize this. Um, you know, we can reduce your cost of ownership by retiring these systems. But does that align with, with what the sponsor's goals are as well? Um, in terms of working with Salesforce administrators, Salesforce developers, you know, you can use diagrams. Um, you know, such as the data model and the role hierarchy to explain, okay, here's the changes um, that we're going to be making um, you know, to the Salesforce configuration. Um, or if we've got integrations, um, explaining to the developers, okay, how's, you know, how are, uh, you know, what's the integration pattern that we're going to use between, you know, two different systems. And then more widely, you know, you can, if you keep your diagrams up to date, um, and, and update them as, as um, you progress or as requirements change, you can use them as tools to impact change, uh, to assess the impact of change. 
Um, so it would be, okay, for example, you know, the integration that used to go point to point between these two systems, it's now going to go via middleware. Let's gather the team around a whiteboard or around an existing diagram on a Teams call um, and discuss what do we think the impact is. I talked a little bit about environment management, so talking to test engineers and tech leads uh, from other systems, from other, other technologies. Um, and then um, also working with data privacy, legal, InfoSec um, to explain you know, how you're going to move data around in the cloud and how you're going to keep it safe. So lots of ways that you can use this. It's not just um, you know, to produce something for yourself to produce a Salesforce um, solution. Um, a couple of other things I would call out as well. Um, so I won't go bullet by bullet on these, um, but the one that jumps out to me, um, you know, based on sort of my recent experiences, diagrams are a great way to uncover hidden requirements, right? Or gotchas that um, might not be uh, immediately evident from, um, you know, just looking at some words on a page. Um, and I've got some examples of that, um, you know, just coming up. But certainly, you know, a diagram always in, always in my experiences encourages collaboration between people. So the data model tells us um, you know, how the objects are related and, um, you know, the record types and the owners. Um, also, um, what the um, OWD, uh, the organization wide defaults are going to be uh, for the sharing model. So is it public read only? Is it going to be private? Uh, you can relate all of this information on a diagram uh, very simply. And then what are the objects that have large data volumes? Role hierarchy will tell us who's internal and who's external, and then how the relationship between those different record owners um, is, is structured and therefore who can access which record um, and how those records are gonna be shared when a path through the role hierarchy is not providing uh, the visibility that they're gonna need. System landscape covers an awful lot of stuff and um, you, know, you can often break these down into layers and talk about integrations in one layer, talk about um, identity and sign on um, with another. Likewise, um, thinking about phases of a project. So um, you may have uh, early phases um, in your deployment or in your um, go live where you're doing data load and having a diagram that really just focuses on the data migration aspects and how data is gonna be extracted um, from one system and loaded into another um, you know, can be very useful. Also a great way to call out what apps are built by us and owned by us, which ones we just use, and where we've perhaps got third party um, functionality from an AppExchange app. A lot of the times an AppExchange app is not just gonna be metadata that's installed in your org, there's also gonna be some backend uh, system that the uh, ISV has produced. So something like a, a Conga or a DocuSign, they have their own cloud infrastructure and it's always useful to represent that as well. And I talked quite a lot about um, the, the deployment uh, already, um, but um, you know, definitely describing where testing is going to happen and which environments. It sounds so basic, um, but I mean, even on projects I've worked on recently, um, there's an opportunity. You know, th there's always the possibility of misalignment between different groups of people. Oh, I thought we were testing in this environment. No, no, no. That that testing is happening in a different environment. So having that information. Um, you know, in a picture that you can point to and all agree and align on uh, is very, very useful. So I think, there we go. So this is what I wanted to show you in terms of adding those extra layers of information into the data model. So if we take one of the, one of the um, boxes from our data model, um, I didn't show it on the other diagrams, you know, because we get too cluttered, but what you can do is you can take uh, the opportunity to, to transfer the information that you, you extracted from your documents um, and put it on the diagram. So you'll remember we were talking about capturing the, the, the volume 
the number of records for uh, any particular object. Um, that I put top right into my diagram. So if I know that it's going to be 500,000 case records, you know, I'll put that out there. Likewise, put in the owner and potentially the external owner. So if we've got, let's say, an opportunity that we're, we're working with partners on, who's going to own that record? Is it going to be owned by an internal user or an external user? Um, the sharing OWD, so is it private? Is it public read only? Um, you know, that also informs very quickly. Somebody's looking at the diagram to get a picture of how the Salesforce system works. And then with connectors, and you'll have to forgive my informal notation here, but that's the best PowerPoint can do. It can't do crow's feet. Um, but being able to, through the use of color, say, oh, this is a lookup relationship versus a master detail relationship. Because if I've got a lookup relationship, I know that the owners on two objects could be different, right? And the OWD could be different because I get the opportunity to set those. Whereas if it's a master detail relationship, the detail end, the child end, is going to be controlled by parents. So I would therefore look at the parent um, box on the diagram in order to say, oh, yes, I know who that owner is going to be. So once you put that information together in my sort of quite simple um, model here, this is an example where we can start to spot hidden requirements or, or hidden gotchas. So here within my, my structure, I've labeled things up with my sharing and with my, with my data volumes. But I can see down here, based on uh, something that was mentioned in the um, requirements, that I might have up to 50 million opportunity line items a year. That's a big number. And so that's something that I want to pay attention to. That number was derived from multiplying you know, the number of opportunities by the typical number of items that's on any, any particular order or any particular, you know, customer order. Um, so it's not a number that appears in text in the scenario, but by mapping the, mapping the, um, the information out onto a diagram, I can now spot numbers that are large that I might want to pay more attention to. And likewise with the role hierarchy, I can relate that to say, okay, who are the people who are going to want to be accessing this record? Am I likely to um, you know, have people who will be querying or reporting over these opportunity line items? And therefore, the large volume could cause me an issue. And therefore, I needed to, to take some action to, um, to attend to that. And I think in the scenario from memory, there was a requirement where the sales agent and the front office team both needed visibility to this. So this would mean that I need sharing rules to exist between here. And actually that's where the real performance impact comes because I've got lots of sharing rules being created. So it's not necessarily I've got a large amount of data. It's just that I will also want to share it in this instance between two different groups of people. And so as an architect, I need to make plans on how I'm going to manage that. Am I going to manage that by archiving? Am I going to manage that by perhaps having some kind of a summary record somewhere so that we don't need to report on, on this? Maybe I want to change my approach to sharing. So it helps me form better questions um, in terms of uh, the overall solution design. And then on the system landscape, I don't think I've got any examples of that. Oh, and here's a, here's a double click uh, into um, a, a more sophisticated version of our environment and deployment. So showing how branches could be used. Um, this is slightly simplified. Um, and like I say, I have been working on, um, on improving this uh, in terms of what I use. Um, Melissa Shepard, if you see, I don't know if Melissa's on the call, Melissa Shepard's got a great version of this diagram um, that I would be very tempted to steal. Um, so it's really up to you if you want to try and pack all the information into one diagram or have several in terms of your, um, your branching strategy and your sandboxes, but I think there is a point where you want to pull them all together. So, so that's the four key pictures. 
I've just got some other ones to mention, which are kind of supplementary then, um, based on my experience over the time since 2017. Um, and that is sequence diagrams, um, capability and process maps. And then let's talk about Salesforce's diagramming framework. So sequence diagrams. So, you know, this isn't in my magic four, but this is, is a tool that, I, that is a very necessary tool for an architect. Um, with a sequence diagram, typically these are used wherever you've got an integration or a sign-on flow. And you know, sign-on flows are, are where these are. You, know, often, you often see examples of them. And it describes with the systems across the top, you know, where a request starts, where it travels to, and then you know, if there's a response, where that response goes. Um, these examples will come from uh, Cloud Sundial. Uh, Lawrence Newcomb's website, um, great place to get anything um, around single sign-on or SAML flows. Um, for me, he's he's you know got the canonical versions of these diagrams. Um, he worked through them, um, I, I think, in code and debugged them to actually see how Salesforce truly worked. Um, so I would definitely recommend uh, those at cloudsundial.com. So sequence diagrams, um, very, very valuable tool. Um, capabilities. So I spent a lot of my time over the last few years really working with customers around talking about the capabilities that they want. And this is a technique that I use instead of having them come to me with a solution and say, I need a new record type or, um, you know, we need to turn on this feature of Salesforce. I try to change the conversation to talk about the capabilities that they're looking to, um, they're looking to access. Um, and the nice thing about capabilities is they're not product specific in the Salesforce world, but you can kind of hint that they are, right? So if we're talking about, um, you know, self, you know, customer self-service, that's going to be an experience cloud. Um, so another good example, audience management, campaign management, those are, you know, within marketing cloud, uh, a little bit of sales cloud as well. There's a really, really good resource. So I've got a few resources I can recommend to you. Um, this uh, Salesforce uh, produced um, assets so it's produced by the enterprise architects within Salesforce. So this is, um, has anybody seen this? Um, I, it's really fantastic. So um, they have, um, you know, basically a capability map built out, which is really, really helpful because I don't need to invent names anymore. Every time I go to a project, I can just, uh, I can just, you know, take these ones. So capabilities of sales, account management, contact management, compensation management, sales enablement, you can go through this. So this is at um, um, uh, sfdc.co slash sfcc. I think I've got the links on the last slide as well. Um, and this is an interactive Prezi. You can dig into these and, and go down to feature level. Really, really useful resource. Matthew, um, Matthew yeah, sorry so to interrupt you here. Are you going to make the slides available? The, a question came. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll send them to you, Andy, and you can post them as you need. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, this is one of those, those cards. So you can see you've got the capabilities listed here and then functions, KPIs all suggested here. Really, really useful resource. Um, yeah, also a great way to get more familiar with different aspects of um, Salesforce. Um, you know, product offering as well. And then when it comes to capability maps, you can start to do some really cool stuff. So hopefully this will come out on the um, um, on the um, on the internet share. So what I like to do in, in order to build engagement is to try and group things by the way customers see things. Um, so this comes, this is a real example from a few years ago um, where I you know, created the capability names based on, you know, how they are at the client. Um, but you can, through the use of color, describe, okay, where are these capabilities coming from today? So in this example, we sort of the ready pink, it's from the legacy, legacy CRM. We've got some marketing um, functionality, marketing capabilities delivered by Salesforce. Um, yellow is, is kind of other. Um, and you can even do things like say, well, to be decided we don't we know we need a data analytics capability but we don't have one and these are things that you can use with um you know management stakeholders executive stakeholders particularly 
uh, people who don't want to get too techy, you can put things in terms of language that they understand. And you can also call out, you know, other gaps like, well, integration is not covered in our current system because in this example, it was all a single .NET monolith system apart from Marketing Cloud. Um, so, you know, there wasn't really any need for integration. But then what you can do is you say, well, this is the 2B view. So, you know, you've, you've signed up to, um, to um, make use of Salesforce. Um, so now everything that was red, we want to turn blue. Well, if, if we do that, we also now need to start working with some integration because where we were previously, you know, just within one system, what we need to be doing now, it, you know, is integrating, you know, different systems together to share the data, right? And you would have a system landscape that goes with that. Then you can do sort of cool stuff like put it in terms of who are the, the different groups of people who are going to use these systems. And then you can do things like to build engagement, um, persuade them that we need to uh, move things around a little bit. I'm not sure it's going to work. Oh, it didn't work. The animation didn't work, I'm afraid, um, but you can sort of move things around the animation and then group things and say, okay, well, engagement is used by these actors, right? Email specialist, CRM manager, acquisitions, responsibility of BDR. And what you're doing here is you're helping them understand how people in their teams are gonna make use of this new functionality that doesn't exist yet. So really helping to get them to buy into the future vision because you're gonna need their help in moving from uh, old technology into new technology. Customer at the heart of everything always. There we go. Um, and then process maps. So sort of just simple flow chart stuff, um, you know, old as the hills, very, very valuable. Um, so anybody who's ever done, you know, business analysis, prior to being an architect, you know, that's your, your bread and butter. Um, and then you can do things like also turn, you know, process, um, you know, process diagrams into process maps and help to explain to people, um, you know, what the challenges are. In this example, it was an e-commerce situation where they wanted sub-second response to provision the user, but we had multiple systems um, that were integrated. And this allowed me to explain to them why it was not gonna be possible um, to, to, you know, have a sub-second response when the user clicked uh, buy um, to having the email come and come and um, drop into their inbox to welcome them as, a, as them as a customer. But from the starting point, we were then able to work through, okay, what are the techniques that we can use, right? We can have re records ready to go on different systems that can just be re, uh, you know, re-keyed um, when a transaction goes through so that we don't have to do so much handshaking with the integration. But working through this with, with stakeholders, both business stakeholders and um, technical stakeholders is much easier when you've got a, got a diagram. So I think that's what, you, know, you can walk through step by step. So when they click buy, whether they're online or um, you know, coming through a call center, you know, what are the steps that are involved to you know connect the identity management system, the CPQ, um, you know, Salesforce CRM together in order to have all of those records that will then allow a user to have their entitlements provisioned and send them the welcome email. So um we did the time. We'll leave time for questions. So Salesforce Architects at architects so Salesforce.com have an ever-growing set of resources. So um, I think about just over 12 months ago, a diagram, Kid of Park Parts was produced um, where you've got this very nice notation from Salesforce, which I think is very pretty and I, I, I do like to use it. Um, but also there's a number of um, example frameworks um, and um, um, also an explanation, an explanation of uh, data model notation, for those of you not familiar, all great resources that are on there. Um, this is a reference architecture gallery. This also continues to grow um, and replaces the, the um, SOAP API um, data model diagrams that existed. So all of this available at architects.salesforce.com and then you can download it 
um, either as uh, a lucid chart, um, a PowerPoint, I think Miro's now supported and um, also Elements Cloud. If you're an Elements Cloud user, they now support this notation. Um, but it uses very similar techniques to what I showed you um, earlier on in terms of you know, packing information into each of those boxes. Um, so here's the example inside um, Lucid. So very nice and you can delete the things you don't want to use and you know, add in your custom objects. Um, and then there's a, a description on the website as well about the framework in terms of drill, drilling down. So I showed some very high level um, diagrams, but of course, at the end of the day, we want to get more and more detail. So having a layered approach to take a high level big picture and then dig into a piece of it and then go down into processor interaction. So this is following that sequence notation that I was I was talking to you about. And then maybe you even want to add in additional detail as well. So there's examples of all of these employing the techniques that I talked about, um, but giving you a really ready to use, you know, lovely looking, um, um, you know, appearance. So I guess the last question is, where is all this going? Um, definitely, you know, Salesforce with the launch of the well-architected framework, there is an emphasis on, on architecting the solution, right? So I think that, you know, telling the story through diagrams is, is part of that. Um, it's a great way to build engagement and communication. Um, but, you know, what I've been talking about has been sort of extracting requirements and turning it into pictures. Um, when you're creating a picture, you're actually creating metadata. And it'd be great if we could send that back into Salesforce. So I'm interested to see where tooling might go in, in the years uh, ahead of us um, if we accept that we want to be architecting rather than than sort of just building and and um, and, and coding things. Um, so um, I think um, the links are there um, on the Bitly link. Um, there's also ladies be architect scenarios as well, which is a great place to practice um, some of these techniques. Um, you know, as seen today and also on the video, um, and then you know, build your own library. I mean, I confess I'm a PowerPoint user. I, I just am. Uh, I'm, I, you know, Lucid Chart is great, but I honestly I like the flexibility of PowerPoint. Um, and I've got lots of PowerPoint diagrams I can pull up and recolor, chop around a bit for different clients. Um, and as an architect, that's a great resource to have. So build your own library. And that is it. So we had a quick recap of diagramming, um, the story of diagramming Salesforce solutions. We went through uh, the process of extracting and structuring, I showed you the four key diagrams, plus some other diagrams that you might want to know, and some, uh, some templates in the diagramming frameworks available from uh, architects.salesforce.com. And I think that is it. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to field any questions. Yes, Matthew, this was fantastic. Thank you very much. Wealth of information. A couple of quick observations from my side. First of all, I don't think your title uh, entirely captures what you, what you just presented to us because you just presented to us how to do an architectural review of a certain scenario facilitating that uh, architectural review using the diagramming solutions. You actually presented to us much more. Second is uh, the more I review and watch these presentations, the more I realize, and this everybody shares, the architectural work is mostly about facilitating discussion, a lot of a lot about communications yeah. and teamwork. And I see that over and over. And uh, you know, it's obvious we know this comes from experience. That's my third point. But you know, the, your presentation. Uh, is is evident. It comes from a lot of experience, and that's why it's even more valuable uh, than what's on the slide set. Thank you very much. And we have a few questions. We we don't have a lot of time, but we will try and go through the questions. And I can go over. I have the time. Uh, yeah, no, uh, no, no problem. And I'm happy to follow up with people offline as well. Um, awesome. No problem. And okay, so the. The first question I see here uh, is when do you capture visibility slash 
profiles, etc., part of the four key diagrams or elsewhere later? Yeah, that's a good one. I think um, I think in terms of profiles, um, when do I do that? I do I do tend to sort of save profiles for later. I think that the the observation I would have is that that key dependency between the data model the owners of the records and therefore the role hierarchy are the thing that i'm keen to get right first because that's very difficult to change if you start off down the wrong route i think profiles and permissions are things where you can say ah oh, you know I, i've got two groups of people who are quite similar but actually i need to separate them well that's quite solvable with um with permissions, these permission sets these days and permission set groups. So, so I think that that's one that I think for me naturally comes out later in the in the in the process because you've got more flexibility. Okay. Next question: Are OWD is public read write nonprofit org, and we have not built out a role hierarchy. We have many cross profile and cross department roll ups. How would you suggest I diagram this? So if you so your users don't have a role, so they're not in the role hierarchy, are you sharing through public groups or something like that, I would think, right? So if you're sharing through public groups, you can have a diagram with your boxes representing the different public groups and have arrows between them saying, are oh, the sharing rules between you know records owned by this by people in this group are you know made available by, to, to that group if if that's what you're doing. I yes. Who asked that question? Is that is that Cindy? You want to un unmute yourself? All right. So we will come back to that later if they are still here. Is there a is there a limit of number of sharing rules allowed in Salesforce per org and or per object? There is. I don't know what it is, but I know there is. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, but yes, there is. And, um, you know, again, that's where, you know, coming up with with the solution, the first version of the solution, and then examining that, you know, either individually or, or with other architect colleagues, um, you can scrutinize these things. But yes, you know, there are many constraints on the Salesforce platform. Um, so, you know, you need to be aware of them and, and validate your designs. Okay, so uh, there is a question about tools, but I think you've answered this. Do you use particular application to create your diagrams, Visio, Figma, IO? And then there's another question. Would you yeah. be willing to share some of your PowerPoint libraries? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the difficulty with that is um, that they're mostly produced for clients. So no, I, I probably can't do that. Um, but you know, I, I'm somewhat of a dinosaur for using PowerPoint, I would say. I, I think, you know, as you saw in some of the diagrams, you know, PowerPoint doesn't even do crow's feet on your um, your entity relationship diagrams. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for moving into, you know, a Lucid, uh, a Miro, um, or, a, or even an Elements world, because kind of a little bit like my where's it going slide. Um, the great thing about diagrams is that you have a lot of artistic license if you want to tell a story. The problem is there are gaps that you could you could allow that to creep in, which when you come to implement it means that it doesn't work. So actually having more rigor and getting tools that are putting more rigor in, I think is the, is the way forward. Um, the best tool though, if you want to tip on the best tool, pencil and paper. Pencil and paper, to start off, otherwise you'll sit there in front of your screen trying to make the perfect diagram. Much better you draw it out first and then turn it into an uh, electronic diagram with whatever your tool is. Yeah, you, you can't beat the UI of pen and paper, right? You know, so, because because you know how to use it. You're fast Ultimately with it. Ultimately flexible. And um, <laughs> yeah. you've got, um, maybe I've got any around here. The, the erasable pens, like the Pilot erasable friction pens. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're great. And I think Susanna said we have 300 per object limit for sharing rules, right, Susanna? Yes. Yep. 50 criteria based. Yeah. Okay. And uh, do we have any other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Did I miss anything?
I guess we don't. So we are right on time. Uh, let's conclude the presentation and I am going to share the recording and I will post it on various different channels. You'll have access to it. And thanks Matthew for also volunteering to share the slide set because you shared quite a number of valuable links on there. So, you know, we'll just go into the yep. slide set and go, go drill down. No problem. Thanks again. And I'll, I'll get that over to you in the next few minutes. So right. thanks, Thank Andy, and it's great to see everyone. Have a have a great have, day. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Matt. Thank you. See ya.